Welcome everyone to our Monday session at the Digital Campfire. And I'm really excited today because we have uh, a thinker who I really admire, Joseph Henrik. And he is a professor of human evolutionary biology at Harvard University. And before that, he was a professor of psychology and economics at the University of British Columbia. And uh, his most recent book is definitely one of my favorite uh, that's come out recently, came out last year. It's called The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly <coughs> Prosperous, which is quite a, quite a difficult title to say out loud, but it really is fantastic. And I think it provides uh, a new perspective on a lot of the topics we've covered on Rebel Wisdom. So the meaning crisis, uh, the breakdown of institutional trust, and also just the general challenge of sense-making in the world we live in. So um, Joe, uh, welcome, it's great to have you. Oh, good to be with you. Great. So uh, I thought a good place to start would, would of course, be um, in defining the term weird. What does it mean to be weird? And how, how did it come about, that, that term? Yeah, so weird is an acronym. It stands for Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. And it came about in the 20 aughts when two colleagues of mine, R. Noren Zion and Steve Heine, we were putting together all the data we could find that had psychological measurements from diverse societies. And the, the case we were making was not only is there substantially more psychological variation than you might think based on the leading journals in uh, behavioral economics or uh, in psychology or in psychology textbooks, but that the populations most studied by researchers were particularly unusual when placed in global perspective. So not only were researchers focusing on one population among many, but they were focusing on a, an unusual slice of humanity uh, to, to, to form our picture of, quote, you know, human psychology. And so we needed a handy label to refer to these unusual populations that inhabited psychology labs. So uh, we came up with this acronym WEIRD. We actually had the title first. So the title of our 2010 paper is called The Weirdest People in a World with a Question Mark. Um, you can see now that I've gotten more confident, I took away the question mark. And, um, uh, and then we came up with the acronym WEIRD to refer to the population. So it's really meant as a consciousness raising acronym uh, to remind people that they're, they're from this unusual population or they are, you know, some of them are. Many and, of the and, prob and probably most of the people on this call would, would be my guess. Um, but so what, what, are some of the, what are some of the unique traits of, of weird populations? Yeah, so in the book, I, I lay out a cluster of traits. So one is individualism, the individualism package. And uh, con uh, cultural psychologists have argued that goes along with more shame, I mean, more guilt relative to shame, more analytic thinking relative to holistic thinking, uh, overconfidence in one's valued skills, uh, focus on one's own attributes and attributions over social relationships, and a cluster of other traits. Uh, also greater impersonal prosociality, so more inclination to interact with trust and be fair with strangers, but relatively less nepotism, less concern with one's tight and close social network. Um, a greater emphasis on intentionality and other mental states when making moral judgments. Uh, so those are some of the major ones. You know, you mentioned in the book that weird populations are actually outliers, you know, which is a great um, aspect of the, of the phrase weird, the acronym. So what, what are, why, why are we, uh, I'm saying we as, as a weird person, why are we outliers and what, what are non-weird cultures like? What are some of the um, traits of non-weird cultures generally? Well, I mean, the, the, all I just went through is a bunch of psychological dimensions. And the key thing to remember is that this is not a dichotomous view, right? The, the acronym is weird, weird is meant to raise people's consciousness. But what I show in the book and maps and lots of plots is you know, continuous variation along these different psychological dimensions. And the case that I make is that there was a particular and peculiar historical process that occurred in Western Europe and began, I argue, in late antiquity uh, and took European populations down an unusual cultural evolutionary trajectory that emphasized individualism and this impersonal prosociality and the role of mental states and whatnot all because of kind of interlocking set of historical processes. And this is what led uh, this, these populations that came out of Europe and eventually expanded around the world to be particularly unusual. But in lots of our analyses, like for example, I think that 
the kinship and families plays a big role in this. So you can analyze the rest of the world and throw away European descent societies, and you can still show that kinship matters. So it's not that this is irrelevant to understanding variation around the rest of the world, but that the processes in Europe place these populations at the extreme on this distribution. And I, I want to talk in a moment about, you know, uh, the, the, the implications of, of uh, kind of understanding, you know, you mentioned a, a, about awareness raising, understanding this kind of uh, particular psychological profile, but it would be great to, to get a bit of a map from you as to how it developed, because that's one of the great things about the book as well as going through history and seeing these, you know, uh, different moments or uh, different decisions that were made that would eventually create this um, particular cultural adaptation. And you used uh, a nice example of if an alien were to come and look at the earth uh, at around the year 1000, what they might see and then kind of what, what happened after that. Yeah, well, so the year I typically use is 1000, um, but in a second, I'll go back before that to get the process leading up to that. So, you know, if your alien comes and is perched on earth around 1000 CE, he's not going to think that Europe is eventually over the next thousand years going to expand around the world and drive the industrial revolution and uh, the science that as a that arises as a consequence is going to you know increase the length of life lower infant mortality end epidemic disease put humans on the moon so a whole bunch of massive innovations as well as a lot of conquest and and destruction along the way possibly the destruction of the environment um, so you wouldn't have picked Europe you would have picked um, China or uh, Central Asia, uh, the Islamic world, places like that. So then the question is what led to this transformation and the rise of these European societies in terms of economic productivity and also this transformation in psychology. And so the case that I make is that it really begins with variation and religious taboos and prescriptions surrounding marriage and the family. And that one particular branch of Christianity, the one that eventually becomes the, the Roman Catholic Church, began to adopt slowly over a period of centuries in you know, bits and pieces over you know, in different bishoprics, um, this thing I call the marriage and family program, which is these prohibitions that eventually dissolve the complex kin-based societies of Europe and breaks them down into monogamous nuclear families. And you have, I mean, at least there's some reason to believe you have monogamous nuclear families in some parts of Europe by around 1000 CE. And then I make the case that this then leads to the proliferation of voluntary associations. So historians have long noticed that Europe is unique in the importance of voluntary associations. So these are things like guilds, which start out as religious groups, but eventually become occupational guilds and then later labor unions, um, universities, these charter towns that pop up all over Europe where people join as individuals or nuclear families and become members. That comes with roles and responsibilities. You swear an oath. Um, and then a whole series of other eventually scientific societies and things like that. Uh, a lot of our professional societies have this kind of heritage. And uh, that these compete competition amongst these societies becomes really important. And then eventually leads to the creation of some of the higher level institutions, which get a lot of the press. So the emergence of democracy at the national level, <clears throat> you know, lots of political representation, uh, capitalistic economics, things like that. In personal markets. And it'd be great to hear a little bit more about what kind of, I mean, what kind of individuals that created, because you, you talk in the book about the, the, how different it is to be in a kin society where you kind of have a, a safety net compared to, you know, joining a, go, going off because you can't marry your cousin, you got to find someone else to marry, go off to a town, join a guild. What does that require of the individual now? Yeah, so the key, the key thing is in, in a world webbed with intensive kinship, so lots of network ties, most of your social ties you have at birth. And you're gonna build new social ties by looking for people that you're interconnected to through existing social ties. This is what guarantees trust. With all those existing relationships, there's gonna be lots of norms and social rules which you have to follow. So you're gonna spend a lot of time trying to avoid not living up to the expectations of following all these norms. And much of who you are is, uh, determined by the by those social networks, so your ability to do things. Whereas in this world of nuclear families, you don't have very much family support. So you have to cultivate a set of attributes and aspirations and accomplishments that distinguish you from others, and then allow you to build mutually beneficial relationships. So in kind of the stark extreme, in one world, 
uh, you have to go out and find your own mates, find your own friends and find your own business partners. And to do that, you have to cultivate this unique self that makes you better than the other guy in competing for these relationships. Uh, and in the other world, you have mostly it's preset by these existing uh, relationships. So in the individualistic world, something like guilt helps you make sure you achieve this, these aspirations and stay on, stay on schedule. And I talk about punctuality and time thrift and things like that. Whereas in the other world, you know, you're, we're webbed into these relationships and a lot of these are permanent relationships determined at birth. So they're not things that can just dissolve. So it's a different, it's a different situation. And you, you talk as well about, um, and you mentioned it before a little bit, the difference between guilt and shame in those two different modes. And um, if I remember correctly, guilt is more closely associated with the individual, uh, individualistic societies where shame is, is kind of more common in the communal. Could you talk a little bit about what is the difference between guilt and shame and, and why does it matter in terms of social cohesion? Right. So, um, you know, shame seems to be a human universal emotion. So we're not talking about the absence of either one of these, but just a relative proportion of importance. And um, shame is that it's that feeling you feel when you violated a widely held social norm and other people are gonna feel badly about you or think badly of you. And, um, uh, and, or you think they're gonna think badly of you. And the other thing that's interesting about shame is it bleeds from one person to the other as a consequence of social interconnectedness. So if your son violates a social norm, that can affect you as the father or parent, you actually experience shame and people will think badly of you just because of something your son did. Whereas in a more of a guilt oriented world, uh, there's an, you can feel guilt for doing something that wasn't a widely shared social norm, and you feel guilt even if nobody knows about it, which is a contrast with the shame world. So, uh, and that's because you're, you develop these personal standards. Now, of course, those personal standards are influenced by the society, but it doesn't mean it's a widely shared norm. So a simple example would be something like going to the gym. You might decide to, to eat a pizza or take a nap instead of going to the gym, and then you might feel bad about that. You might feel guilty about it. But your neighbor is not going to necessarily think badly of you because he might not have that, uh, that rule about going to the gym every day. So, it, it, But it's something that you're cultivating that as an attribute, as something that you want to be for yourself so you experience guilt about it. So that's the basic difference. And it has to do with that the navigating the two network structures that I talked about. And there's actually a nice example that I've just remembered um, that you use, which is, and it's worth mentioning, there are a lot of different psychological studies that you've, you've done across cultures to, to gather this data. Um, one of them is called the passenger's dilemma, which, which I think sort of uh, touches on this. Could you describe what that is? And then maybe because we've got 50 odd people here from around the world, I thought it might be cool to see in the chat what people's response might be to the passenger's dilemma. Um, but maybe you could lay out, lay out what it is and we can, we can do a very um, Great. poorly run yeah, so this, experiment. Yeah. This is a cool experiment because it's been widely done against uh, corporate managers. So it, all the people who do this from different places are all corporate managers, but you get massive variation how people respond to this. So the basic dilemma is you're driving in a car with your friend. You can vary the relationship of the person you're driving with. Uh, they're driving and they're driving recklessly and then they hit someone and they kill them. So uh, the, um, uh, there's gonna be, there's a, there's a law case and their lawyer says that if you testify in court that they were driving the speed limit, no one else saw anything so your friend will get off. Um, if, there, if you don't testify that the, they was driving under the speed limit, then he might, they probably get jail time. So the question is, what do you do? Do you lie in court for your friend and should he expect you to, uh, or do you tell the truth? And so then people vary quite a bit. Some societies, 90% of people say you should t testify honestly. Other societies say that would be immoral and your, your loyalty is to your friend and you should lie in court to help your friend. So I like this because it's a, it's a case of two virtues, right? We all think that, I mean, we probably all think that loyalty to friends is an important virtue and telling the truth uh, in, in personal institutions is a virtue. So you got to trade off those somehow. One thing I, I was curious as, as I was reading it and as I've been thinking about your work a bit is the arguably the newest institution that we have. And I want to talk about the importance of institutions as well, um, as I think that that's a fascinating aspect of your work. But one of the newest institutions we have is arguably social media. And social media seems very interesting in light of your work because it's very individualistic. It's very, very based around making yourself whoever you want to be. And it's also strangely communal. So what do you make of, of social media based on, based on you know, your own work? Is it, is it a weird thing? Is it, is it a human thing? How do you see it? 
Well, um, we actually, in some cases, we, what we do is social media, but I, I, I took advantage of data that's available because of Google and things like that to study Google searches uh, in different countries. Um, I would actually be interested in studying how people from different populations use uh, social media and, for example, construct their Facebook networks or something like that. I think we pick up lots of interesting cultural variation in that. Uh, so kind of cultural differences affecting how we use this media. Um, well, one thing, one thing, it, um, one of the reasons I was so uh, curious about it was this, um, uh, this trait of voluntary association you talked about of, of choosing which, which group you belong to. Um, and there's a there's another one, uh, another trait as well, which is that you mentioned in the book, not really a trait, more like a behavior, I guess, of outsourcing our trust to institutions because we, we don't have those kin networks anymore. Um, be interesting to hear a little bit more about how that developed and, and how important is that in, in weird psychology? Yeah, so I make the case that so if think about market exchange, so if you, you know, trade is, of course, really old humans have been trading all the way back into the Paleolithic period. Um, there's lots of interesting anthropological, anthropological and historical work on trade in China, you know, trade along the Yangtze, for example, trade in the ancient Middle East through these networks run by these families and houses and interesting religious elements to that. But what appears to have been happened in Europe was something different because you have these small nuclear families. Uh, people developed what was called merchant's law. And there were a set of norms for, that described how you had to interact with strangers. And often these were enforced by these voluntary associations. So if you were in the clockmakers guild, you had certain rules that you had to, to obey when you were dealing with, doing your business dealings. But if you didn't, that would affect the reputation of your, of your voluntary association of the other clockmakers. So they would be inclined to, to bring you into line. And unlike a clan or some kind of family group, they could kick you out. Right, so they could end your membership in that group. So they can sort for people who are gonna go along with these kind of impersonal, impartial rules for commerce. So, so the argument is that these get built into the culture. People's willingness to cooperate with or behave fairly with strangers is actually strongly predicted by the degree of market integration of different populations. So you can even see that within the same ethno-linguistic groups. So a great study was done by the economist Devish Rashtagi in Ethiopia. And Devish studied 53 different villages and he showed that the villages that were closest to the market uh, were much more willing to cooperate in a two-person interaction among strangers compared to members of that same ethnolinguistic group who lived further away. Uh, and there's a number of other studies that show the same kind of pattern. So it seems like markets are really important in getting this, this impersonal pro-sociality going, a certain kind of market exchange. So, so we have the markets and then also be interesting to hear about the institutions that that kind of maintain social order in a sense so we have the court system which was part of the example we used earlier with the passengers dilemma we have uh, the media we have so many institutions that we kind of uh, rely on um would it be i mean yeah would it be safe to say that the health of our institutions is sort of embedded in our own psychological health in some way yeah, so one of the key ideas I try to develop in the book is that aspects of our psychology co-evolve with our institutions, and that includes our formal institutions. So a lot of, uh, well, a lot of contemporary institutions that rely on high levels of impersonal trust. And when that begins to go, when you don't have as much impersonal trust, you get things like corruption. And when corruption gets highest, institutions start not to function particularly well. Uh, and in the book, I make the case actually that the emergence of this weirder psychology in the high middle ages actually helps us understand the peculiar character of Western law as it starts to develop in the high middle ages. So think 1100, 1200, something like that. Um, you know, there's various people, most of them actually kind of religious scholars working on putting together canon law or other kinds of law, but it's very much about individuals. Individuals have rights and properties and dispositions um, you know, and you can't punish the father for the crimes of his son the way you can in lots of places and you could in Europe before this point. And, and so it begins to build law around individuals and gives personality to organizations. So we think about corporate law, but corporate law begins with church, the church getting a personality where it has liability and responsibility as an entity independent of the people inside of it. And, you know, over the last decade or more, uh, you know, some argue it's been a longer process, 
our, our trust in our institutions is um, been eroded for many different reasons. Um, you know, and even if I just think of recent history, uh, the imagery of the storming of the Capitol building, um, the financial crash, uh, George Floyd, so many of our institutions that we have trusted are being questioned and aren't trustworthy. Um, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that and the implications, but also whether there's any historical correlate for that, where, where we've really been in a situation where we've thought, yeah, I can't outsource my trust there anymore. And, and what happens? Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, consistent with the view in the book, the, the psychology and the institutions have to fit together. And if trust gets too low, the institutions will start to malfunction. I mean, I feel like the, I was having this debate. I, maybe they're, they've been convinced now by, re, by you know, recent events, but um, convincing economists that the, you, know, you can't think of formal institutions as divorced from the sort of informal norms and, and psychology of the people was something that was, was hard to get through. It was, it was a sense in which the institution would just function and all the contracts were complete. It's how economists think of it. When really it's all about that we all have to agree to at least, enough of us have to agree for the institution to work at all. And if you ever reach the critical tipping point where there's not enough agreement, then the whole institution uh, explodes. Um, yeah, and so you need a certain amount of shared psychology, shared trust and whatnot to, to make those things function. Uh, in terms of historical parallels, we, we've been trying to develop techniques and we have some techniques for tracking change in psychology over time. And um, one thing that's clear from US history is that there's been uh, big surges in uh, at least some kinds of trust as a consequence of wars. So we use US newspapers. This is work with my, the economist Max Winkler. US newspapers to measure things like moral universalism um, uh, and you can get individualism, things like tightness and looseness. So some of the psychology I talk about in the book, and you can see when the wars, World War I, World War II hits, um, you can see there's a big concern with kind of like community cooperation and whatnot. So uh, it may be that the world wars in the US history had a big effect upon pulling Americans together. So one of the things we, we've covered a lot in Rebel Wisdom is um, systems change. And you know, talking to people who are very focused on um, either reforming existing institutions, um, or some say scrap them all, let's build new ones. Um, and whatever the case may be, there, there there seems to be a fairly consistent theme that one of the issues we have in the West is that we're too individualistic and we're not communal enough, and we don't have enough cohesion of the kind perhaps we would have had, you know, during World War II, for example. What do you make of that argument, like the argument that we're, we're too weird for our own good? Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, to remember, the, the pendulum has kept moving. So we have enough data now just from the discipline of psychology, uh, you know, putting aside my newspaper or our newspaper measures, that we can see things like conformity declining over the last 50 years of U.S. history. It's a good bet that individualism has, you know, people's focus on themselves has been increasing. Uh, even if you compare Western countries, the U.S. is often at the extreme ends of the distribution on things like individualism. Uh, and, and there's nothing about the ideas I developed that suggest you can't have too much of these things, right, to, to, that the institutions might require a certain amount of uh, collectivism or at least kind of shared solidarity at some, at some group level. So one idea is this um, notion that some of our voluntary associations, where there's this book called Bowling Alone, that Americans used to form a, uh, more of these voluntary associations like the Lions Club or the Rotary Club or things like that, where they would bring together and build local social cohesion to get things done more at the grassroots level. And then they also had this super, super uh, this national identity, Americans, but they also, so they had both things going. And the, the case in the, uh, in the book is basically you need both of those because these small groups create the competition among them that builds up the social capital or, I mean, that's what the economists would call it, you know, cooperative inclinations towards a certain group of people. Um, so it could be you need that dynamic and part of that dynamic has been corroded. Uh, even if you look at like competition among firms. So I show that that's an important force in, in creating more generalized trust with the rise of, uh, you know, so much of the economy is absorbed in these companies that monopolize things like Amazon or like Google, that there's actually not very much competition, not like there used to be, at least in those sectors of the economy. So there's another uh, big theme running through your book, which is um, religion 
um, and, and gods, in fact, in different cultures. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more in a moment about the role that religion has played uh, in, in our evolution um, and the role it's playing or perhaps not playing now. But you also talk about the Protestant Reformation, for example, and, and the sense of um, having a God and being kind of uh, accountable to a, to a God or gods um, and how that's, you know, played a huge role. Yeah, so um, let me give a little bit of background on the religion before I jump into the Protestant part. So, uh, you know, in one of the places in the book, I'm setting up the evolution of human societies, and I make the case that the evolution of certain kinds of religion had, a, had an effect on the scaling up of human societies. So 10,000 10, years ago, humans lived in relatively small scale societies. And then over the last 10,000 years, we've had the emergence of pre-modern states and large scale societies and urbanization. So in order to do that, we had to do something very unnatural, which was bring together strangers for relatively harmonious interaction, trade, exchange, cooperation and warfare, cooperation in public works, things like that. So how do you get on? So it's an evolutionary question. How do you get unrelated individuals to cooperate. And one of the factors that a lot of research is now pointing to is that the emergence of these certain kinds of these universalizing religions. So some of them are big God religions where you have a high, powerful, moralizing God that punishes people for certain kinds of behavior. And my colleagues and I have made the case that this evolved over a long period of time as a way of creating greater internal harmony and expanding the sphere of social cooperation. So even something as odd, seemingly odd as a supernatural agent caring about the sexual behavior of a bunch of primates, mainly, mainly us. Um, why would a God care about that? Well, if adultery is one of the main things that, or intersexual competition is one of the main things that creates problems, and lots of evidence suggests that it is, then it would be good, you know, if you could tamp that down a little bit, you could reduce, you could increase the amount of harmony in society. So societies compete, and you get this push for these bigger, more powerful, moralizing gods. There's other ways to do this. There's karma religions, which seem to do something similar using some somewhat different supernatural beliefs, but there's some convergence there. And uh, okay, so then the case that I make with regards to Christianity is that if you looked at the world in 300 CE, it wouldn't have been obvious that the, the Christians descended from Rome were going to be the dominant form of Christianity in the world. But because of the success that was the societies had as a consequence of this marriage and family program, 90% of Christians in the world today come from the lineage that expands, that, that's the Roman lineage. It doesn't come from, you know, um, Syrian Christianity or Coptic Christianity or Armenian Christianity or all the other different kinds of Christianity. And, uh, and then, okay, so then with that, I'm trying to explain the origins of Protestantism. So if you're familiar with Max Weber, he puts a great deal of emphasis on uh, Protestantism in the origins of capitalism, modern economic institutions. So part of what I'm doing is, is kind of filling a gap which is how'd you ever get to Protestantism in the first place? And it should be puzzling because Protestantism, at least the forms that have become popular are extremely individualistic. And I make the case that they actually crystallize some of the key elements of weird psychology that in my account were developing prior to Protestantism. So an emphasis on the importance of mental states and moral judgments is, is one that I provide cross-cultural evidence for and make the case for. And if you think about Protestantism putting the emphasis on religious faith, as opposed to good works, um, the emphasis on underlying, I mean, there it's all about underlying mental states. An increasing emphasis on hard work. Uh, that's something you see in, in the more successful Protestant faiths. It's something you can see in the Cistercian order, which you know, goes back to say 1000 CE. So it precedes um, Protestantism, but it just kind of crystallizes it and then you know, expands with Protestantism. There's a number of other things, time, thrift, temporal discounting patients, a bunch of things you get with Protestantism, which I think of as a kind of booster shot to what the, the church's transformation of the kinship systems and markets had already done. It kind of wraps it all up in a supernatural package. And then I, you know, with some statistical data and stuff, you can make a case that this had a real impact on things like economic growth and, and other changes. As someone who studies cultural evolution and the evolution of people, when when you look out the window, what ways do you think, what ways are you anticipating we're evolving culturally? Uh, and, you know, we, we have uh, a rising China, for example. We have, um, you know, plenty of problems in the West. What's your uh, best guess, let's say, for the next 25, 30 years? Um, well, I don't have uh, strong uh, prognostic inclinations. Uh, I guess, I mean, 
and what you said, we were, we were talking about the internet before. So one of the problems with the internet is it allows people to sort by like with like. So people find those similar to themselves and then they can group up and just listen to uh, those who are similar to themselves. Um, before that period, people were often forced together in the workplace or in these voluntary associations. So they would have personal relationships with people who might have very different political beliefs or other religious beliefs than themselves. Uh, and those personal relationships really help to, to bind the society together. So the degree to which we can realize that those, those kind of uh, virtual silos that people begin to live in um, are a problem, if we can create institutions or technologies to reduce that, I mean, you know, some of us are adopting where we intentionally uh, vary our, our Facebook interconnections and our Twitter interconnections, but I don't think that's widespread at this point. So the degree to which we can realize that and, and make it happen. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that what we're also seeing is, you know, weird institutions spread around the world after 1500, but they're now recombined in lots of interesting ways. So the institutions, you know, Japan's institutions, some of them at least are a virtual copy of the United States's and other ones are uh, copies of uh, other European countries or European countries. And, uh, but these are intermixed with a uh, different way of thinking and a different way of organizing. So the Japanese judicial system is just like the American formally, but it works completely differently. So Japanese don't sue each other, for example, like Americans do, at least at the rates, even though the, the legal, the formal structures are pretty similar. Um, and then of course in China, you have a whole other loop recombination, old ways of doing things and, and uh, ways of thinking that were present before the expansion of Western style economic institutions, universities, things like that. So you're getting a whole new recombination there. So I see this as kind of, you know, more cultural evolution, interesting variation, new recombinations, and then selection and competition and selection. Yeah, and that might be a, a nice place to um, uh, end before we, we go into the Q&A, because this is a theme of your work, this kind of sense of recombination being like the fuel of innovation in culture um, and your book the secret of our success is kind of about this could you, could you talk a little bit more about that because you know we've we've talked about um the kind of decentralized collective intelligence of the internet being something that drives innovation but this is a very um very kind of deeply rooted aspect of, of culture uh, in your view yeah so the case that i make in the secret of our success is really you know, the fundamental thing about humans is the fact that we can learn from each other. And this means we accumulate knowledge, techniques, how to make tools, how to build institutions over time. And then much of the innovation, whether it's a new institutional form or a new technology or even a new grammatical system, new words, come from recombination. So different groups that have been doing different stuff meet, ideas recombine. Some of them are good. Most of them are bad. We take the ones that work and, and move forward. So this is this recombination is really the fertile source of, of new ways of doing things. Um, and then at first for technology, this is super clear. So you can analyze um, the you know patent data and see the effect of recombination. You can look at the way that in, inner immigrants into the US have supercharged innovation because they're bringing different ways of doing things and different techniques. And it actually makes the natives more creative when you have lots of immigration. Um, so we're gonna open up for, in the last half an hour for a QA. and a And um, if you could use the, either the hand raising function or, or put a question directly into the chat and I'll call on you. Um, if you could do it with a Q and then the question. Um, and also, uh, just before we start, uh, I forgot to give the results of our very professional experiment uh, with the passenger's dilemma. You know, it looks like uh, most of the people here would turn their friend in, uh, although it was pretty close. It was, I'd say, 60-40. And there was, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and um, discussion about what, what the wider context was and what kind of friend they were as well, which was good. So, um, uh, Joe Zaya. Uh, you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks a bunch, Joe. That was a uh, that was great. I just ordered your book on Audible, so I'll be reading it, listening to it very shortly. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was the lack of reference to racial, like racial identities, being a a a, a relevant uh, thing to look at, um, which to my way of thinking feels very refreshing and actually a lot opens up the door to look at more more relevant um dimensions of cultural difference like socioeconomic status different assumptions different like uh, work ethics like all of these or 
yeah some I'm saying this clumsily but um I'm curious if you're uh in framing uh the the weird idea you intentionally left out the racial dimension if that was something that just was not relevant so it didn't come up how it interfaces with the weird idea how race interfaces with weird um yeah I'll, I'll leave it there yeah so um I mean it was it, one of the one of the ideas here that I'm developing is that uh you know our institutions and languages uh, and technology shape how we think and you know and so we can look at the experience of lots of countries that have had a lot of in migration and you know people over sometimes it takes a few generations it might even take more than one you know two generations uh, but but immigrants assimilate which means that there's no way in which this can be tacked to uh, race meaning you know genetically transmitted uh, phenotypic cues like skin skin tone or something like that hair form so um, you know anybody who acculturates to a particular community could become weird or non weird if you know if they if they move somewhere else or, or join uh, communities that are you know diverse so um, psychologically diverse so yeah so that's why I didn't emphasize it um, now it does there are ways in which weird psychology can inform us about how the how people have come to think about race or at least historically thought about race so one of the things that I argue is that uh, weird psychology tends to think dispositionally and um, that means it is it's in order to explain the behavior of an individual it tends to not look at the context and the relationships but tends to infer underlying traits so someone is trustworthy or lazy or traits like that um, rather than saying you know uh, why did he show up late for work or why was he tired at work well because you know there was extenuating circumstances his kid was up screaming all night or you know his tire his car went flat tire went flat on the way to work so there's all kinds of contextual reasons but lots of research from cultural psychology suggests there's this dispositional way of thinking and that then of course can bleed into all kinds of stereotyping and um uh, you know essentialist thinking about different populations does that does that get uh, your question or is there more stuff you wanted me to talk about yeah no no i mean that that kind of fleshes it out a bit the the i'm struck by most like the way you frame weird um <laughs> weird as a as like a kind of a uh mode of understanding or a, a frame through which to look at um uh you know cultural uh phenomena um it's it's often it's very closely maps on to what people often just i think lazily characterize as white culture um and uh the that identifying different yeah identifying the um yeah uh, the sort of underlying yeah the underlying i don't know historical realities that gave rise to our culture that has i think very yeah i don't know weird instead of white like makes so much more sense to me and so right. that seems like a very yeah, useful and, and and that has been uh a critique and in fact one of i mean one of the one of the things I think the, that one of the arguments the book makes is it really pushes a bank against it pushes back against um, political ideologies that might suggest something like white supremacism or European superiority, because as we were talking about at the beginning, you know, we have the space aliens looking down at a thousand and if they were going to say, you know, who's going to dominate the next century, the next millennium, they would have picked the Islamic world or China for sure. Right. So as recently as a thousand years ago, the picture of who the wealthy people in the world was completely different. It was almost reversed. No, it wasn't quite reversed, but it was um, definitely within Eurasia, Europe, Europe was a backwater. Uh, so then that transforms over the next, you know, 800 years. And um, so it also removes any kind of notion of essentialism. So one of the things I spend time in the book doing is looking at the details of the expansion of the church through Europe. And I show how you can explain variation among the psychology of Europeans by knowing how long particular parts of Europe have been under the church. And I do this, for example, just in Italy. So you can explain the variation among Italy's 93 provinces by knowing some of the details of the history of Italy. Most people don't realize it because they think Italy is all Catholic, but the southern part of Italy was under the Orthodox Church, the Byzantine Empire, and Islamic powers for into the high Middle Ages and wasn't incorporated under the Roman Church until relatively late. Compared to northern Italy, 
you know, home of the Renaissance and the banking, the emergence of European banking industries was under the church's umbrella for transforming the kinship system from the Carolingian empire. Uh, you know, so Charlemagne conquers basically Northern Italy and then it all gets put under this. So it has a much longer history. Same thing in France and Italy. So we, I show how you can explain the variation there. And I also apply the theory to variation within India and within China. Now those are interesting places because while they don't have any history of church until relatively recently, uh, they do have differences in the kinship system due to ecological factors. So there I show how you get variation in psychology due to kinship, um, but due to but where ecological factors are in the background rather than differences in religion. Um, so, so, so then these are all changes that occurred over centuries, not some essential nature of different peoples. Thanks a bunch. It's uh, fascinating. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, let, we've got a few great questions. Uh, Gabby, uh, yours kind of slightly uh, follows on from that. So go with yours next and then we'll get to that. Yeah, I was just kind of curious in the uh, how you see um, students like universities responding to uh, your claims, because it seems that it's kind of like a it goes against their own narrative of like intersectional anti-racist and uh, so I was just kind of curious if you're experiencing any kind of pushback or if you have like support of people just like I don't know just I would like to hear your thoughts more on that yeah I mean uh I mean it definitely has ruffled people's feathers or some people's feathers um Certainly not the scientific community, but there's the kind of wider humanities community uh, that, I mean, you know, within history, there's a strain of people, it's certainly true within anthropology, that kind of immediately get turned off by any kind of big idea, any kind of thing that tries to explain broad patterns. And, you know, I have all this data and there's statistical analyses and we have databases and we're quantifying and trying to measure stuff. And that turns lots of folks in the humanities off. So I definitely get a lot of pushback for, from them. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned this point about white supremacism is because one of the other interesting experiences I've had is, you know, in the university, there seems to be a great interest in diversity. But as soon as they suggest there's any differences, people start getting nervous. So people want diversity without difference. But if there are people really are diverse and there's lots of evidence they're psychologically diverse, then this has got to have implications. It can't be just all neutral. Um, so it's got to have implications for economics and politics and stuff like that. And so what I'm trying to do is, you know, take it seriously and say, well, what's the psychological variation? What's its implication for different political and economic institutions? And then that's, you know, that gives us real information that we can use to build better institutions, figure out what the best immigration policy is, all that kind of stuff. But only when we have the data can we build better policy. So in the end, it's more about culture than actually race. Uh, at least that's kind of like what it showed in the UK recently with one of their studies showing that you can have people from the same race but different ethnic groups that will have different experiences like in the UK. Yeah, uh, yeah, and so exactly. And, uh, you know, we have, we have lots of analyses that show that. So for example, when we do our analyses, of, we, so we do a second generation immigrant analysis. So this is a pretty cool technique that developed by, were developed by economists. So we go to the surveys from Europe and we take all of, we just extract the second generation immigrants. So these are people who migrated into some European country uh, from somewhere else. And they, they grew up their entire life in Europe and we measure their experience of being, um, uh, their experience of oppression, um, their feelings of this discrimination, we have their income, education, wealth. And what we're able to show is that things like trust, fairness, and individualism can still be predicted by the places and ethno-linguistic groups of their parents. Now, it's, a, it's not a strong effect, right? It's an echo, right? We're, we're picking up an echo from where their parents moved from that they learned from growing up both with their parents and also with whatever communities their parents are attached to. Um, they look much more like the majority cultures of where they live than their parents do, uh, but yet you can still pick up this echo. And um, it holds even when you control for wealth, income, education, feelings of being discriminated against, all that kind of stuff. And so that suggests that this really is this kind of kinship effect that's being a cultural effect, essentially. Thank you. Great. So next up, uh, Tarek. Uh, 
Uh, thank you both. Yeah, I, I would like perhaps just a, maybe a general commentary on the prosperous uh, part of the title. And is there a link between being weird and becoming prosperous? Um, and if so, what's your measuring stick for prosperity? And what do you yeah. mean by that? So, uh, you know, I, I hopefully I develop this appropriately in the book, but one of the questions that I'm trying to get at is one of the central questions in economics. And it was really Adam Smith's question. Uh, which is why are some countries rich and some countries poor? And the kinds of measures I have in mind are the kinds that economists care about. So uh, GDP per capita, you could do uh, life of length, you could do uh, infant mortality rates, any of those kinds of things you could use as metrics, they all run together. Um, and so the question is, wh why is there variation among places in those metrics? And why has that changed in particular ways over historical time? So again, back to that space alien, you know, there was this famously Darren Atze Moglu talks about a reversal of fortunes. So things were relatively better in China and India and lots of places at 1500. And then after that, things seemed to reserve, reverse. Of course, there's lots of colonialism to be, that's part of this, but I don't think that, so one of the arguments I have, and this relates to the university, uh, some of my critics, um, is that colonialism isn't an explanation. It's the thing to be explained. So there's lots of incidences where some populations over human history expand at the expense of others. The question is always, why are they able to do it? Um, so, I mean, the Northern Chinese expanded South in China, Austronesians expanded across the Pacific out of Indonesia, Bantu speakers expanded out of Cameroon across uh, Southern Africa, uh, Muslim populations expanded out of the Middle East and went East and West. So, um, but then why, the question is, why were those populations able to do it? And I'm trying to provide an explanation for why after 1500, Europeans were able to militarily and economically conquer so many different parts of the world, but then also give rise to the industrial revolution. So the, you know, steam engine and the massive flow of innovations that began to be generated in England and then later in Germany, and France and the US. Does that help? Yes, it does. I guess it leaves me a little bit curious as to maybe perhaps any other metrics uh, that may uh, shed light on the weird uh, kind of cultural phenomenon that may counterbalance the, say, economic metrics of GDP per capita and length of life, and, uh, life expectancy and so forth. Perhaps things that, you know, um, like depression rates, suicide rates, um, feelings of alienation, you know, the, the things that we can kind of feel in the West now, but may yep. not be uh, visible at the economic level. Yeah, so um, I try to bring up some of those. So uh, one, one interesting one is uh, happiness. So it's, a, it's a pretty well established that um, being more material secure uh, and wealthier makes people happier. It's not a linear relationship, it's actually logarithmic. Uh, but generally, if you make people wealthier, you, you make them happier, except interestingly, at the individual level within, you know, rich countries and poor countries, people who are tied in with more kinship ties are happier. So there's this interesting contrasting effect where, you know, my story says you should have a few kinship ties and, and other, there's other economic data on this. If you want to have a, a well-functioning economy using Western institutions, so caveat, there might be another way to do this that we haven't figured out, but given Western institutions, you're better to have small nuclear families, you have lower corruption, all this kind of stuff. Um, but if you live in a big extended family network, you're happier. Uh, so that's one interesting fact. Uh, another, another one that I bring up in the book is uh, suicide. So I talked about Protestantism, hard work, uh, time thrift. Now, those two, to a weird person, those sound like compliments, right? But keep in mind that you can go somewhere else in the world and those are not compliments. Uh, so, so there is this difference in what we think is a good trait, uh, but along the lines of suicide, it does seem that Protestantism went along with suicide. So this is a famous speculation by Emil Durkheim and I think Faber too, uh, that now there's good evidence showing that Protestantism is associated with greater suicide. The idea is just the one Faber had, which is that you know, you're, you're alone, you have few ties, it's just you and God, there's not even a priest you can go to, there's no community, you know, it's this one-on-one -on -one relationship with this supernatural agent who has high expectations, uh, and so, so you feel bad about it. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks both. Uh, Patricia, you're up next. Thanks. Um, so my question is, where do we go from here as as the world 
becomes more homogenous, are all the cultures going to become weird? Are are uh, cultures that aren't weird now going to uh, evolve in that direction, or are are weird cultures going to become more clan and family oriented? What do you see happening? Yeah, uh, so so great question, and I think. I mean, so here I'm going to use the kind of general patterns of history and kind of speculate wildly. Uh, but the usual story is that you have an expansion and that creates a degree of homogenation. So the expansion of global commerce, international trade, generally the process we call global globalization, uh, Western secular institutions, representative government, democracy, social safety nets, all this kind of stuff is going to weaken families. So we're going to see a demo. Uh, reduction in the intensity of kinship in lots of places. But remember that kinship is always there. So as soon as there's collapse, economic dislocation, that starts to reassert itself. I mean, just one of the fundamental ways in which humans build social relationships is through kin networks. So that's not something that you can just get away and it's gone. It's always ready to reassert itself. Um, so, the, so that's one thing that's going to homogenize. But as these institutions and ways of thinking and norms are going to uh, different places with different histories, they're just not annihilating those things, they're recombining with existing events. So earlier I mentioned, you know, how the legal system in, in Japan works differently. So that's a new and interesting recombination. It's got lots of weird elements, but it's got lots of non-weird elements too. Um, same things happen in China. So they have Western style, at least somewhat Western style economic system, but without democracy, right? So what is that gonna do? What's that gonna look like? And of course, there's lots of other interesting things there. Um, so just different places are creating new recombinations. So it's a new kind of diversity. Uh, on the language front, we're certainly losing linguistic diversity. So I don't think there's, I don't think there's a flip side to that. Um, but certainly in the institutions, we're getting a lot more diversity. We're, we're just about um, out of time. And so, yeah, I wanted to, to say a big, big thank you to, to Joseph Henrik for uh, joining us here today. Yeah, it's good to be with you. Likewise. And yeah, thanks everyone for, for tuning in and for your excellent questions today as well. Um, really kind of open the conversation out to uh, another level, which is great. And in, in typical Rebel Wisdom fashion, if you'd like to unmute yourself and say a, a thank you and goodbye to Joe, please do. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting.